Hello everyone. Welcome to the second session of our church planning training program. If you're listening tonight, that means that God has not taken away the desire for you to just grow in this area. Maybe the desire to plant a church or just to grow in the inner workings of a of a church planner and uh, and the church. And so if you're here with us, we welcome you again. And we're going to be going over three sections today. As we left off last week, we were talking actually about uh, just the introduction. And we went over, as we look in the manual, the, the one who, who should plant in Calvary Chapel, the one that is Christ changed, Christ called, and the one that has Christ-like character. And today we're going to be talking about the Christ confident, the Christ capable, and the Christ committed. And so with that, let's go ahead and get started. And let's talk about... Uh, the one who was called to plant a church, the first one is Christ confident. Uh, as it says there in the book, it says, depend on the power of Christ rather than your own ability. Either our confidence is going to be in ourselves or it's going to be in Christ. And we know that effective spiritual leaders, those that are mature, those that have uh, just uh, come to a place of completely depending on him, find out that their need for dependence is on the power of Christ rather than themselves. Again, when we think about the individual that is called to plant a church, we really got to get to the point of just understanding that you and I are truly called to be Christ confident. We're to completely be confident in the fact that he is able to do these things through us. We have to be a people of great faith of strong faith and of trust in him. As he says there that apart from him, we can't do anything. I mean, that's what the scriptures tell us, right? In John 15, verse 5, that we can't do anything apart from him. And in him, we will bear abundant fruit. You and I will bear abundant fruit. Let me go ahead and read this to you. I, I think it's such an awesome, awesome scripture I believe that this is one of our one of my favorite scriptures, and I believe that as we look at this scripture, it becomes or will become one of our favorite scriptures. As it says here in chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. I love that. The fact that he prunes us, the fact that he works in and through us, the fact that he takes away and chips off those rough edges so that he can bear a greater fruit. He prunes those, those, uh, those things in us. And the only way to do that, of course, will be through trials that come our way. He says, you are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you cannot do nothing. Nothing. And that's what I love about God's word. It's very truthful and very forward uh, in the fact that it tells us all the things that are true and all the things that we need to know. We know that uh, apart from him, we can't do anything. And through him, we can do all things. You know, one of the things that I've come to learn is the fact that, that it is the Lord that equips us. It is the Lord that does his work through us. Any talent, any gifts, anything that we do that is good, it comes from him. And I love it because the word of God reveals this to us. Let me give you here again through First Peter chapter 4 verse 11 in first peter chapter 4 verse 11 we are told if anyone speaks let him speak as the oracles of god if anyone ministers if anyone ministers if anyone serves let him do it as with the ability which god supplies the ability that would that god supplies the ability which god supplies that in all things god may be glorified through jesus christ to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever Again, this is so vital for us to understand that it is God that bears this fruit. It is God that, that equips us to do things, and it is God that works through us. Are you available? Will you be available? And that is what we are as church planners. We make ourselves available. We, we go ahead and just 
look at these things that are before us and we just say, you know what, God, you can do it. You can do these things. If you want me to take a step of faith, I'm going to take a step of faith because I know that you will meet me there. And we just become so dependent on God. And this is so vital for us to realize that as we breathe, it is God that allows us to breathe. And, and as we do things, it is He that does them through us. And as a church planner, we must come to this place of understanding that it is God and God alone. The next section that we look here, when we look at the Christ-confident man, he says that we must be emptied of self-confidence. We must be emptied of self-confidence. He gives us the example of Moses. Moses was chosen by God to lead his people, and he sensed the call of God upon his life. And we know that Moses began with a lot of self-confidence. This is what happened. He was, you know what, in the world in Egypt. Egypt is, a, as we know, a symbol of the world. And he sure did have a lot of confidence, right, as he grew up in Egypt. We know that the Bible reveals, or I should say, let me reveal this to you, that the Bible reveals that when it came to Moses, he was learned in the wisdom of Egypt. He was learned in the wisdom of the world. And it tells us that he was mighty in deeds and in words, or mighty in words and in deeds. Again, this is who he was in the world, but God needed to just break him of all that he learned from the world. And we know that he brought him into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 years. It took 40 years to empty him out of the world. When it comes to us, is it going to take 40 years? As church planners, I hope it doesn't because it's going to be very difficult for us to do this work that God has called us to do, to plant a work, to plant his, his church. Because we're going to be doing it in our own strength. And when we do things in our own strength, then we know that the Lord isn't building the house and it's going to be built in vain. And, and when we do it in our own strength, it's going to take our strength to continue to maintain it. And we don't want to do that. He goes on to say here that Peter needed also to be emptied of self-confident. It was another example that he gives us so that he can truly be used by God as a leader he reminds us that in the Garden of Gethsemane, hours before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus foretold that all disciples would stumble at the events that were to take place. But Peter, what does he say? You know what? Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. You know, Peter believed that even if all others denied the relationship with Jesus, that he would stand firm. And Peter was willing to, def to die to defend Jesus. Unfortunately, we know that this self-confidence would hinder Peter's effectiveness as a leader because it would keep him from appropriating the power of the Holy Spirit rather than his own strength. You know, there's much, much to say with this. See, we know that self-confidence moves us to do it in our own strength. But as God's Word tells us, it's not by might nor by power, but by His Holy Spirit, says the Lord. And that's what's so important to this. Because I want the power of God to do it. I don't want my own strength to do it. I don't want my own power, my own self-confidence. Because I know it's going to go nowhere. It's not going to bear fruit. It's not going to be effective. I would rather have God's power moving through me than my own power. Because I know that I can't do anything. I know that what I do is done in vain. I know that what I do isn't going to profit much. It's, it's going to burn. It's not going to be effective. But yet what God does, His work is long-lasting. And His power is far greater than our own. And so these are the things that, that, again, that we're reminded of as we go through this, because these are the things that you must take in, that you must begin now to breathe within yourself, that you cannot be self-confident, but you got to be, uh, but you must be Christ-confident. He goes on to talk in, in, in section C, the need for a thriving spiritual life. Spiritual leaders are most effective when they have a thriving spiritual life rather than simple, simply ministry skills per se. He says, People you lead can often discern whether you are close to God or not. We talked about this uh, in our first uh, section. Moses reflecting the glory of God. And we also know that, that just like jo uh, Jacob, he gives us the example. Remember, Jacob wrestled with God. Why did he wrestle with God? Because, again, his dependency was not on God. And he finally gave up. And, and he finally said, you know what, Lord? I need to be dependent upon you. 
You know what? As he wrestled with God, as as he finally saw the, the Messiah there and he realized, you know what? I've been wrestling with my own self. I've been wrestling again, even though he was wrestling with the Lord, but he understood what was actually happening, his own battles within himself, and he finally gave up. And so we know one thing for us as church planners, we mentioned this the other day, the fact that dependence is reflected in prayer life, devotion life, peace and trust in Christ and the lack of scheming and manipulation. We talked about the prayer life. We talked about the devotional life, how vital those are for us. But I love what he reminds us here, the fact that you're going to have peace and trust in Christ. When things get hard in the ministry, as I mentioned to you, things will get hard. People will come against you. You will have outside people coming against you, inside people coming against you. You will have issues that arise. Well, we got to trust in the Lord. And this is, these are the things that the Lord teaches us as we continue to persevere in the work that God called us to do. But you also find yourself with less scheming and manipulation. These are the things that we bring in from the world. Manipulating things so that we can do things our way or get things done the way we want them to get done, the way we think. Instead, you know what? Lord, you open the door because you are the one that opens them and you are the one that closes them. I don't want to bust doors open that God is not in. Otherwise, I'm headed for a deep fall. But yet, it's God that we look to to open doors and to close doors. Again, we have a scripture here that he reminds us, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. One of my favorite scriptures, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own understanding, your own emotions. But in all your ways, you acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Again, our job is to trust him as he says and his plan for his church rather than relying on our own ideas, our own ideas that are independent of him. We want to be dependent of him. We want to be Christ, Christ confident, dependent on him only. And so again, as he reminds us here, he says, if you depend on him and seek to bring glory to him, then he will direct your path, remove obstacles and get you to the destination he desires for his church. Realize this is his church. It's not your church. All you are is an under shepherd. All you are is just a, a steward of this work that God, that belongs to God. The quicker we understand that it is Christ's work, it is his work. It's not your own work. It's not my work. That, you know what, that, that you begin to, to give him the full reign, the full control, the full, you know what, uh, the, the, the wheel itself. I mean, because we don't want to lead this. I don't want to lead this church. I want him to lead it. All I want to do is be sensitive to his voice and to allow him to lead it. And we see many churches that have started and they've closed. And many, probably because they weren't allowing God to lead. Because if God leads, then he's going to bear fruit, right? Because we can do all things and he's the one that bears the fruit through us. We can do all things through him. The next section we're going to talk about is Christ capable. As it says there, lead church planners generally have most of the following gifts, apostleship, the gift of apostleship, the, which is really a missionary gift to go out and to, and to go into these places and to share the gospel, leadership, evangelism, teaching, faith, and shepherding. Leading and teaching, as he says, must be the most important. Let's go ahead and talk about leading first. You're able to cast vision, mobilize, inspire, and build systems. It seems like an oxy, it seems axiomatic that lead pastors be able to lead, but again, leaders must know where God is leading them. If you don't know where God's leading you, if God hasn't given you vision, then how are you going to give the congregants the vision that God has given you? Remember Moses, he was called to lead the people, so he had a vision that's God is leading us into the promised land. All we have to do is be dependent on him. All we have to do is trust in him. All we have to do is believe what he's asking us to do and do it. Follow his commands. Yet they neglected to do that. The same thing with us. What vision does he give you as a church planner? What does he want you to do? And so these are the things that you need to, I guess, come to a, a, a very, very, quiet place where you hear the Lord speaking to you. Just like Elijah, remember when he went to, into the cave, you know what, the 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 earthquake, the wind came, the, uh, all these things were happening, but yet the Lord was not in them. He was where? 
in the cave. He heard that small, still voice. He was in that quiet place. And that's the same thing for us. Are we very sensitive to his voice? Are we sensitive to what he wants to share? And so he goes on to say that uh, we must be able to persuade others to follow. And so C. Peter Wagon describes leadership as a spiritual ability that God gives to certain members of the body of Christ to set goals in accordance with God's purposes for the future and to communicate these goals in such a way that they voluntarily and harmoniously work to accomplish these goals for the glory of God. Are you able to communicate and strategize effectively? Although pastoral care is important, it is not the primary role of the pastor of the church. The more important roles include casting vision and having people come alongside that vision and believe in that vision. Again, developing, I mean, and then he says developing leaders. The key to all of this is we need to develop the next leaders. What has been given to us, give it to faithful men. What we've been taught, give it to faithful men so that they can take it to the next level. Teaching, prayer, and making disciples. Again, making disciples. Again, that's, that's what we want to do as church planners, right? We want to make sure that people are taught, people come to the faith, and, and, and we want to make sure that they're growing in the grace and in the knowledge of the, of the Lord. We're discipling them, making them in, uh, imitators of Christ, how key that is, and that's part of the Great Commission. Chuck Swindoll, he says, observes that the key in inspiring influence, no, I'm sorry, that the key is inspiring influence. Those who do the best job of management, those most successful as leaders, Use their influence to inspire others to follow, to work harder, to sacrifice if necessary. Understand that when godliness and great vision are combined in the same person, that individual exerts great influence over others. When godliness and great vision. Remember, people are looking at you. People are looking at me. We need to make sure that we are godly, that we are holy, that we are, we are uh, behaving as Christ would expect us to behave, as leaders, as teachers, as under-shepherds. Again, your character is vital, integrity, as we talked about before. Not being a two-faced, not being a hypocrite, not being a great actor, but being what? Transparent in, in your holiness and your godliness. It tells us that the average pastor can care for only about 75 people. So the, for the church to grow beyond that level, it requires a pastor to learn effectively. I'm sorry. Let me reread that. I jump ahead here. It says, so the church... So for the church to grow beyond that level requires a pastor to learn to effectively lead by establishing administration, organization, systems, delegating, and intentionally mentoring others to lead. And we know that with, uh, with just Moses, a, a perfect example of that. Remember, his, his father-in-law had to come and to correct him because he was taking all the responsibility and he wasn't raising up others to help them in the duties as a leader. So again, these are very critical for us to train others up, to relieve our responsibilities so we can focus on the things that God has called us to do. But it takes us the uh, it takes us to that place of realizing that we need to to develop in these areas teaching, effectively communicate the truth of the text. As we see here, for us at Calvary Chapel, I mean, it is so key that we continue to teach verse by verse. We do topicals once in a while, but the majority of our time is doing expositional teaching, verse by verse, or chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And that is so key. That's how people grow. That's how people develop. As Pastor Chuck would tell us, you know what? Well-fed sheep will beget more sheep. They will begin to share their faith and they will begin to invite them to church and you're going to see just the ministry growing the example we have here that he gives us is one of ezra where he says that ezra in ezra chapter 7 verse 10 it says that he prepared his heart to seek the lord I mean, i'm sorry to seek the law of the lord in other words to to study it and to do it to apply it and to teach it um, important he wanted to uh, to study it to do it and to teach it how important is that? Studying, doing it, and teaching it. You know, you could study it and not do it. We have to be also doers of the word, as we are told, and we can teach others. And so, again, the reminder of being, uh, being a, an effective communicator is vital when it comes to Christ capable. We also need to distinguish teaching from a 
dynamic personality or oratory skills. In other words, you can draw large crowds but not be teaching the Word of God. Again, we need to be people that, that are teaching the Word of God. And as we see, for all of us, as teachers, we have a stricter judgment. So are you effectively teaching the Word of God or are you just a dynamic uh, um, personality or do you have just great oratory skills? We want to be teachers. We want to be effective teachers. And that's what we desire to do. It says, and he reminds us of certain things here. Do you develop yourself to study the word and to seek to grow as a communicator of the truth? Have you studied systematic theology? Again, you know what? Are you studying what the Bible is teaching? Do you spend quantity time observing and interpreting the text before trying to apply the text to people's lives? Are people growing in their understanding of God as a result of your teaching? Does anyone want to hear what you have to say? While numbers are not the litmus test of teaching success, if you are not, if you are unable to attract people, you may not have the gift. The last we're talking about is shepherding. Pastors will give an account to God for how they cared for the spiritual well-being of those they were entrusted to care for. Again, we need to love people and be diligent to care for the flock. Don't view people as an audience, but love them the way Jesus loved them. Jesus had so much compassion for people. Do you have compassion for people? I'll give you a personal testimony here. When this ministry started, I went, I was driving and I had never noticed this food bank and I happened to see this food bank in Hacienda Heights and I didn't know it was a food bank. I just saw like 150 to 200 people, approximately that amount of people standing out there. And I said, wow, you know what? These people, they look like they need the Lord. I had so much compassion for them. And so I went in and I asked them, what do you do here? They said, they feed the poor and the needy. And I said, well, can I help? They said, absolutely. And so when I went to go help, they said, just take the food to their, to their cars. Well, as I was walking with them, I had a compassion for these people. And I was asking them, how are you guys doing? And they would tell me their issues and their problems. And I would ask them if they need prayer. Well, every week I kept going and I kept going back because I had a compassion for them. I wanted them to know Jesus. I wanted them to know the hope in Jesus. I wanted salvation upon their lives. And so what I ended up doing is is I started just continually uh, uh, praying for them and teaching them God's word as I would go with them, speaking with them as, as I would go to their cars. Well, as I would do this, they began to ask me, you know what, can you come to my house and teach me the word? And several of them began to ask me that. So I was going on Tuesday nights to different people's homes to teach them the word of God. And it all started with the compassion for these people. And so again, as we see here, we see the fact that we are to protect them from, from wolves who attempt to draw them from Christ to themselves. And remember this, the sheep never belong to you. They belong to Jesus. That's one of the hardest things for many pastors to do is to say, you know what? These sheep are the Lord's. If the Lord brings them, they're under the care that God has entrusted me with. If they want to leave, they're free to leave. That's why they're congregants. They're not members. Don't try to hold on to people. Just let them go. As they come to you, they come. And as they leave, the Lord may be sending them out. And if they're leaving because they're disgruntled, the Lord will deal with them. Don't worry about that. The Word of God tells us that God sets shepherds over His people who will care for them. Remember, He told this to Jeremiah, as we read last week. It's so important that it is God that chooses the shepherds for his people. Let's go into the third and final section, Christ committed. Church planning, as it says, the work of initiation, soil preparation, planting and cultivation and harvest are difficult, but you reap what you sow. The best additive for a healthy garden is the gardener's shadow, time and your presence. Thus, you commit to Christ, commit to the word, commit to the people and allow the process of church planning to unfold naturally and supernaturally. Commit to Christ, commit to the work, commit to the people, and allow the process of church planning to unfold naturally, supernaturally. One of the keys to this, as he says there in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in part A, he says perse perseverance is the key. It tells us that the average tenure for a pastor is three years and less than two years for a youth pastor. Unfortunately, most pastors finish their race prematurely. You know what? When they came to Paul, Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 
And so he says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only me, but also all those who loved his appearance. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. We're told here that Paul knew what, uh, what did Paul, I'm sorry, he asked the questions. What did Paul know that would help us to be Christ committed and to finish our race? First, he understood that it was a fight, a good fight, but nonetheless a fight. Be prepared for the battle. It is a battle. To be a church planner, it is a battle. There's so much opposition. And the quicker we know that it will be a battle, the more we're going to expect it and we're not going to be discouraged by it. Second, Paul saw the relation between finishing the race and keeping the faith. Oh man, it's so important to finish the race and keep the faith. If you depart from what? Sound doctrine and your healthy healthy relationship with Christ, you are likely to fail to finish this race. And third, understand that although his primary motivation for ministry was love for God, he was confident that there were eternal rewards waiting. Please remember that Christ desires to greet you with the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, we also have another insightful experience from, uh, from the life of Paul. When Paul gathered the elders from the church at Ephesus, they implored him to go down to Jerusalem as, a, as great, they, I'm sorry, they implored him not to go to Jerusalem as great hardship was awaiting him. Paul knew that he was called to go and also knew that he would suffer, but he replied, none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. When we think to ourselves, he decided to go to the city, the city he would serve, that he would not be moved by whatever was awaiting him. Okay, again, ask yourself, as he says, what might move you from the commitment to your call? What's going to move you from the commitment to your call? Secondly, Paul decided that his life was simply a sacrifice. Once you determine that your life is a sacrifice to Jesus and the work that he's called you to do, it's much easier to endure the inerrant difficulties. It's easier because it's a sacrifice. Once we realize that this work that God has called us is truly a sacrifice and not many people are called to it. But those that are called, remember, it's a sacrifice. And God will equip you, but it's not going to be easy. There's still going to be challenges because he's developing you as a leader, as a pastor, as the church planter. Stop, as he reminds us, don't compare ourselves to someone else's ministry. Remember Peter and John. Peter says, well, what about John? As the Lord told Peter how he would finish the race. And, and Peter says, well, what about this man? And we know that the Lord says, don't worry about him. You just follow me. You just follow me. Just worry about your relationship with me. Don't worry about others. Don't compare yourself with others. You will easily become discouraged. I love this scripture. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. The, last, uh, the next thing that he talks about, the last thing in this section is understanding balance and boundaries. They are essential. Learning to use your time wisely, redeeming the time that the days are evil. We are never to lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way. Time is precious commodity. Use it to advance God's kingdom while you can, knowing the opposition in, the, in, the, in these days. Beware of busyness without spirit-led purpose. Busyness without spirit-led purpose. Make sure that the Lord is leading us, guiding us. We can be distracted. We can get into all these things that are not spirit-led. Make sure that what we're doing is spirit-led and ask the Lord to take away these, these, uh, these, these things that are trying to pull you away from doing what God has called us to do. You can easily be there. I have been there and I am there. And you know what? I got to just focus on what God is calling us to do and what God is calling me to do. What is fruitful and what is not fruitful, we got to get or take away from our lives. If you don't make time for your physical health, you are unlikely to finish the race. We know that bodily exercise provides temporal profit. We understand that, but still be healthy. You don't want to be taken because of a heart attack, because uh, you don't exercise or take care of yourself. We got to take care of these bodies that God gave us so that we can what fulfill whatever God has for us. That it's not because of our own mistakes that we are that our race is cut short. 
And so let's go ahead and, and pour into, uh, into our, own well, our own health and well-being. We know that people will push the envelope, as he reminds us, and seek to get more out of you. But again, boundaries are important. You know, be careful with your evenings, your weekends, whatever day, whatever time, you know what, establish boundaries. Make sure that you're not, you know, working all day, 12 hours a day. Otherwise, you're going to burn out. And so, again, we got to make sure that we not neglect our family. As I mentioned to you last time that we would talk about this again, your family is your first ministry. Don't forget to make your family a priority. Don't neglect your family. And then finally, I want to leave you with this. The church can be a seductive mistress for a church planner. So you need to be on guard before she destroys your family. I got to repeat that. The church can be a seductive mistress for a church planner. So you need to be on guard before she destroys your family. Wow. A seductive mistress. Don't let her destroy your family. Your family is your first ministry. That is what God wants to make sure that you're taking care of first. Make sure you're praying with them, reading with them, revealing to them and showing them uh, by your example what it means to be a godly father, godly husband, godly church planner. And uh, so next week, we're going to look at what, or not next week, next time, I should say, uh, what is a Calvary Chapel Church? What is a Calvary Chapel Church? We're going to look at several several uh, of these topics. Uh, we'll go over them as we get there next, uh, next time. You may hear it next week. It may be tomorrow that you hear it. Whatever it is, that's our next section. What is a Calvary Chapel Church? Well, God bless you, and we'll see you soon. Bye now.